going to do it on the cloud. And we lost the beginning, but we are now live. So I'm going to, uh, so here are some of the key pieces that we're going to be walking through today's workshop. Again, we'll go, you'll get to meet the rest of the facilitators. We're going to really ground ourselves in some key terms and concepts because we want to really build and bridge from the same understanding. And we'll go into a little bit of the statistics and the stories behind some of the work um, challenges that uh, women experiencing homelessness face. And then we'll talk about solutions, collective solutions, what you can do, and then um, close it with some next steps. So I will uh, go to the next slide. And so here's where we'll definitely want to hear from you too. So please introduce yourself in the chat, share your name, your pronoun, what community you live in, what organization you're a part of. And also what brought you here. Definitely we have folks, we have tons of folks from our team who are here to, to also respond. But um, I will pause to introduce myself, which I am Gabriela. I'm the Deputy Director of Women at Every Women Campaign. And I live in Central Los Angeles. And I've been with, with that Every Women Campaign now for Uh oh, I think Gabriella froze. So maybe we'll move on to one of the other folks until she gets back. Oh, okay, she's back. Yay. Okay. You're on mute. I apologize. I have like the worst internet in the universe. I apologize. Um, so how about I pass it? I think I don't know how much of that uh, was captured, but I've talked enough. So I'm going to pass it over to Lorena from the, uh, uh, from the Downtown Women's Center. So if we can go back. Thanks, Gabriela. If you have the worst internet, I've got construction. So <laughs> between the two of us. That's what it is. <laughs> uh, well, hi, good evening, everyone. Lorena Sanchez from the Downtown Women's Center. Very happy to be with you tonight. Uh, thank you for introducing me as an expert. I certainly feel knowledgeable, but I, I feel like mostly where we are uh, trying to do the work and get out of the way. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And my role at the Downtown Women's Center is I oversee development and communication, all of our public affairs work. And I love doing events like this that raise public awareness. I'll pass it on. Should I go next? Yeah, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I just, please excuse me, my allergies have came all the way back in full motion. I was like, oh, flowers, and I remember what flowers do. Um, hi, I am Nerbese Flint with Black Women for Wellness and Black Women for Wellness Action Project. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am born and raised in Los Angeles um, in the Northeast side, which people are like, where is that? Um, so in I grew up in Silver Lake and I live in Echo Park. Um, and I am super excited just to hear from the rest of the panelists today. Um, such great folks to be here with. Um, and I will turn it over to Tiffany. Thank you. My name is Tiffany DuVernay Smith and my pronoun is Warrior Queen. I live in Exposition Park and this is like the toughest question ever. An organization I'm a part of. So I'm not going to say everything I do, but the Timeless Group is a reentry organization. NAMI Urban LA is a mental health organization. Cal Voices is mental health advocacy, CSH, Corporation for Supportive Housing. I'm a speak up advocate and I do also do consulting for them. And uh, at this time I'm employed by LASA, the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority. And I'll be sharing my testimony later um, from the lived experience perspective of being a woman and being homeless and other intersectionalities. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tiffany. We're, we're so happy to have you as well. 
And again, uh, thank you all. And, and please keep introducing yourself in the chat. So again, as we mentioned, we wanted to ensure that we grounded sort of the, the language that we'll be using, the terms, the concepts. So we'll pass it over to, um, oh, can you go to the next slide? Thanks, Frank. Um, again, you know, gender justice is, is still such, you know, an integral part of what we're all building together intentionally. And we wanted to ensure that we framed it as a systematic redistribution of power and opportunities and access for people of all genders through the dismantling of harmful structures, including uh, patriarchy, homophobia, and transphobia. It really, you know, it also also stems like, what does it mean for us, right? Like we all get to define, as Tiffany said, like we are, we can define ourselves as warriors. We can define ourselves as fighters and caretakers. You know, I'm a mama. So for me, like number one role is a caretaker and, you know, and, and, and we all get to, to express it of what it looks like to us. And so please, um, you know, feel free to, to share some of that. You're going to hear this through this concept, through the lens of the work that we all do through housing justice. And that's why it was very important to bridge both housing and gender justice, because it really is, you know, an essential human right for us to have a home and also to be able to, you know, firmly stand in our, who we are and who we identify with. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, you'll hear sort of from, from all of our perspectives and backgrounds, uh, especially from the work that we do. So I'm gonna pass it over to Lorena. Oh no, I'm sorry, to <laughs> Lorena. Yes, but we, um, and again, we want to be very transparent. We are trying to um, make sure that we are sharing the information and also, for it to flow as much. So, uh, Norvise, I'll ask her to you um, to talk about the next piece. You are on mute, Norvise. I was just going to mile a minute, sorry y'all. Um, so what I was seeing is re reproductive justice is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, I do want to, uh, say one quick thing about gender justice, which I think is important because when we talk about terms, um, I think it's really good for us to have like the shared language because when we think about, um, sometimes we're using the same words and they don't always mean the same thing. And so the only other piece I just wanted to add really quickly when gender justice is that this is the spectrum of gender, right? So it does, it's not just inclusive to just women. It's, it could be trans, cis, gender non-conforming, femmes, all the folks in gender and gender justice. And that has to do with your gender identity, not having to do specifically with your, your sexuality, right? And those two things are pretty important to like splice up that gender identity is different than your sexuality. Um, and that when we talk about gender justice, we're thinking about your gender identities in the full spectrum of them. So with that being said, I think that's a great lead into what is reproductive justice. So RJ started in 1994 and it was started by black women who did not see themselves in the in the civil rights movement in the second wave of feminism. And so what does that mean? In some spaces, they were having to choose, like in a lot of Black spaces, they were having to choose their race over their gender. And in um, some of the feminist spaces, particularly the second wave feminists, they were having to choose their gender over their race. And why kind of the mainstream white women organizations were fighting for the right to not have children, Black women and women of color were fighting for the right to have children. Right. And so that is a really important distinction. So reproductive justice comes from a human rights framework that is a mix of social justice and reproductive rights. It is an evolving framework. It is a young framework when you think about the kind of justice movements. But we say it's evolving because we have changed our language as we learn and grow. Right. Um, and so a lot of the work early is very woman centered, um, but now we have been and been trying to be more inclusive of gender identities and the spectrum of gender identities, right? But it's still based in looking at structural and institutional problems that cause oppression, right? And so 
this is one of the definitions that we use. Um, so reproductive justice means the human rights to control our sexuality, our gender, our work, and our reproduction. That right can only be achieved when all people have the complete economic, social, and political power and resources to make healthy decisions about our bodies, our families, and our communities in all areas of our lives. So that's a whole lot to say when someone's like, well, what is RJ? And so the quick thing that we usually say is everything that has to do with having a child, not having a child, and being able to raise your family with dignity and respect. And so that can be everything from environmental justice to reproductive rights, to access to water, to intimate partner violence, to criminal justice, to education, because we know all of those things have to impact, are impacting how we're able to raise families, whether we get to raise families, and whether or not we choose to have family, and how we choose what our family is. We can go to the next slide. So intersectionality is a really important part of the reproductive justice space. And it was another term created by another Black woman who is a fave and is still teaching, um, Kimberly Crenshaw. And when we talk about intersectionality, we're talking about whole selves. So a lot of times in public health and in other spaces, we have a tendency to split people up or split our, identity, our identities up, right? So for me, I am Black, I am a woman, I am cis, I am from Los Angeles, you know, I have pretty good education, and all those things are a part of me, right? But a lot of times in public health and other places, we had to be, you know, put my Blackness over here, my womanness over here, my education over here. And so we have these like broken ways in which we look at folks. And intersectionality talks about the wholeness of people, right? We're looking at people in their full identities, both their powers and privileges, right? And also the oppressions that they experience. And we use intersectionality or the, the framework of intersectionality in reproductive justice as we think about how do we approach the work that looks at full bodies and full selves. Right. And so that is an integral part of how we do our work is making sure that we're not splitting people up and that your race and your gender and your class are all things that we can't really pick apart when we're trying to talk about problems and solutions to those issues. Hopefully that makes sense for everybody. So intersectional views of, uh, of economic and inequality. So one of the things that we talk about quite a bit is this space on how economics has a complete impact on your reproductive justice and what is possible you know, for you to be able to start families. And a couple of things that I think are really important is that a lot of folks are living in poverty, both United States and in California. And thinking about what that looks like when we talk about folks who are living in poverty um, is that if you do not have enough money to pay your rent, if you don't have enough money to eat, if or uh, have food security, if you do not have enough money to feel safe, right, then that limits your options on what you are actually able to achieve and what you are able to dream. Right. And so one of the biggest pieces that I like to break out in Los Angeles is that 14.4% of Black women between the ages of 16 to 64 are unemployed, which is one of the highest rates across all of all women. Right. And so we're looking at folks who have these compounded intersectionalities, right? So if you are Black, we already know that you're dealing with racism and white supremacy. And if you are a woman, you're already dealing with sexism, right? And if you're making less than the dollar um, than a white man does for the same work, which both Black and Latinx folks do, right? That's already putting you down. So you're working harder for the same, um, or for less amount of money. And then your options to be able to actually be in space um, to actually have the opportunity for a job is actually limited as well. So when it comes to the feelings of being able to choose how and the safety and where you live, right? If you don't have a job, we all know you. it is hard as hell trying to find an apartment in Los Angeles. It's already hard as hell right now to find housing in Los Angeles, regardless of how much you got going on and how much money. But if you are unemployed, it is just that much more harder 
for that to happen. And when we see and we look at, if we go downtown and we see and look in the streets of who is out there, the communities that are out there, we see black folks, right? And see black women, which are one of the highest rising, older black women, one of the highest rising folks who are experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. Go to the next slide. So the effects on COVID, I think is particularly important. Um, we know that women in general have a tendency to be working in service jobs. And so, and we know service jobs were one of the hardest hit. And when we're talking about service jobs, we're talking about hotel industries, we're talking about restaurant industries, we're talking about cleaning services. And so many of those jobs were absolutely cut when we first started with COVID and many of them have not came back. And if you look at some of the national statistics, black women in particular had some of their jobs have not come back yet, right? So there's a bounce back for a lot of folks, um, but not really for women of color and particularly for black women. And so when we think about not only the folks who were been most impacted because we know it was impacting black and brown folks the most in terms of actually experience COVID, right? And so, because we were in the service space and we were are the folks who take care of your family and we are the folks that were at the, um, the grocery stores and all that as well, right? So we have that piece that's happening. And then on the extra layer of it, right? We also have the jobs that were easiest to get rid of are the folks, the ones that disappeared were the ones that are also the folks of color, right? And then when the bounce back happened, we're at the last, we're the last folks to be in. And so we're still thinking about that impact of those pieces. And the other folks, this is, um, I'm not sure if I'm talking about this, this on the next slide or not, but um, that has a, a very intimate connection to domestic violence and intimate partner violence. Um, and so we mentioned it here, um, and gendered and domestic violence has increased with many women forced to shelter in place with their abusers, right? But when we talk and think about, we are, again, these layers, we're already making less money on the dollar, right? We already have unemployment rates that are actually extra high. We have sexism and racism that's impacting us, that is limiting our options, that makes folks who and women of color particularly vulnerable to being in spaces that are right for domestic violence and not having a lot of spaces to move, right? Because, you know, again, if you can't, if you don't have a job, it's hard to find an apartment, right? We know that if you cannot afford to move by yourself or you have family, that's one of the other pieces that you are thinking about. And so all these things are layered and became essentially highlighted in the bright spots when COVID came around. Let me go to the next slide. So Los Angeles, um, black women make up about well, nine. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, am I not supposed to say this? I'll shut up, I'll go to Lamar. No, well, um, oh. we have very transparent uh, moderation going here. So forgive us as we jump over each other. Uh, I can just jump in and then, you jump in if I leave anything out. Yes, sorry, I forgot which ones I was supposed to do. <laughs> we moved around. Um, well, here, let it in again from Downtown Women's Center. Uh, just before we go into the slide, for the sake of everyone, I wanted to make sure we were all on the same page with some of the terms that we throw around. Um, namely, uh, a lot of the information on the slide comes from either the annual homeless count and for those of you that don't know, there's a kind of like a point in time census of the unhoused population that takes place every year in Los Angeles. Los Angeles opts in to do it every year. It usually takes place in late January. Uh, the last one taking place in January, 2020. Uh, and this information is super crucial. It feeds back into policymakers, into service providers, into advocates. And we use that to advocate for better services or services that address the, the direct unique needs. Uh, the increase, there was an increase from the homeless count that took place in 2019 to 2020 of just about 13%. Uh, and there was a 16, 16%, 16%, one 
increase in women's homelessness. Uh, and tying it back to the theme that is kind of emerging from, from what's been said already is that of that 16% of which 49% of the cisgender women and 60% of the transgender individuals reported experiencing some form of domestic or intimate partner violence. And we'll get a little bit more into that as we go along. Um, that's the information that you see in that right column there uh, that has to pertains to that homeless count. Um, the other column is speaking to something called the Downtown Women Needs Assessment. And this is community-based research that's been around since 2001. And it came out of the need to uh, seek more information about the experiences of women. And it surveys things like their access to resources, uh, characteristics and conditions that they face. The most recent report uh, was published last year and it had to do with a survey conducted in 2019. And that's when that report grew from surveying women in the Skid Row community to citywide uh, Los Angeles. And hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be conducting the first countywide assessment um, in, in the years to come, starting planning the summer. Um, something to highlight that this report really helped to highlight is the importance of having gender specific and trauma informed housing and healthcare solutions. Um, feeling like a, a broken record, but the, the women that were surveyed, over 60% reported experiencing violence in the last year. Uh, and so again, that domestic and intim intimate partner violence, but also most telling and speaking to tonight's theme of gender justice is that over 80% talked about how housing was the most difficult resource to access. Um, and then 50% of that same group identified lack of shelter beds and wait lists and um, as being a major barrier. And if you, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, common drivers of homelessness uh, listed here, you know, won't surprise anyone, anyone really living in Los Angeles, lack of access to affordable housing, giant disparity between rent and income, um, domestic violence, age and lack of a social safety net, and then various um, family uh, challenges, either it could be things like due to rejection of uh, unplanned, unplanned pregnancy or, or coming out. Also, um, what has been highlighted previously by Norbese is just the, the, the economic disparities that, that women, um, individuals identifying as female face, gender pay gap, um, occupational segregation, educational inequities. And I don't know if you both have, Tiffany and Norbis, they have more to add here. Those are some of the things that you know, being rent burden as well is, is a giant factor. I'd just like to read the discussion question and encourage participation. Whether you have another question, you know, to tap the Q&A or to leave comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. So for this particular one, are any of these surprising to you and have you personally experienced housing instability as a result of any of these factors? And then a question from another slide, a previous slide, what are some policy interventions or forms of support or relief that would help women during the pandemic? And I encourage participation, so please put your comments um, in the chat <laughs> because I know the goal of everyone in is to end homelessness, right? Mm -hmm. And to bring everyone in. So your solutions and suggestions can definitely help drive policy changes. So feel free to share your opinion with us. Thank you. Nervous, any, any thoughts on adding things to common drivers? I think one of the things that that was surprising to me is that uh, women make up currently about one third of the unhoused population in Los Angeles and we don't have that equivalent in terms of housing or or shelter beds and it's you know how can we how can we hope to meet that challenge unless we can keep up with with the resources needed 
Yeah, the only thing I would add is that um, having a child is one of those pieces that actually increases your um, risk, unfortunately. Um, I know that, I don't know everybody's offhand, but I know for Black women, um, 70% of single Black moms, yeah, are paying, um, excuse me, single Black moms are paying 70% of what they take in on average to just cover their rent. And so if you think about cost burden and that the vast majority of people should be paying, I think what they say affordability is about 30% of how much that is, right, above that and how little you have to play with if something goes wrong. Ooh, should I share my thoughts? <laughs> Please. So a definition I would like to give. <clears throat> so criminogenic, the definition is of a system situation or place causing or likely to cause criminal behavior. So I've also heard, so you mentioned intersectionality being multiple identities. And I've also heard intersectionality as far as um, several things overlapping. So like for me, it shows up in my life as domestic violence and law enforcement contact and mental health and homelessness, right? And so because the systems are racist and criminogenic, you know, I happen to believe that Black women are paying 70, 70% of their money is going to rent, is connected to the Black man and how he's treated and being incarcerated and how he's treated after being incarcerated. And I will say when I toured a shelter trying to figure out where am I going to be sleeping, uh, we, I toured the women's, I didn't know there was a side. I thought I was just touring a women's shelter. But on the way out, I got a glimpse into the other side, which was all, it was so many black men. Like my heart just sank. And I'm like, is this where all the black men are? It was crazy to me. So I definitely believe that if our system wasn't so criminogenic, our systems, right, so criminogenic and so racist that there would be more su financial support and that our Black women wouldn't be in the situation that they're in. And so it's planned to be that way. That's my belief. Okay, uh, my, uh, yeah, I'm not muted. Um, so I think it, it will surprise no one that since the pandemic hit the state, there's been a reported increase in the number of domestic violence cases and 911 calls related to domestic violence abuse, especially in large cities like Los Angeles. Uh, I was reading earlier that LA County Department of Public Health reported a 32% rise in DV calls in December of last year. Um, with an all-time spike in May when DV calls were triple that of May 2019. And another recent report from the National Commission on COVID and Criminal Justice documented an 8% increase in DV incidents uh, nationwide, 8% increase, um, which further reinforces what the Women's Needs Assessment found uh, a stat I shared earlier that 60% when, when you're unhoused, you're likely to experience some form of violence, whether it's domestic or from an intimate partner. And I believe my colleagues had some thoughts here to add as well. Yeah, I just wanted to, oh, Tiffany, did you wanna go ahead? No, you, you go for it. Oh, wait. I'm gathering my thoughts. <laughs> Um, the only thing that I would say that like the, the intimate partner violence um, 
and your ability to be safe, what has said before, and the ability to make money and how COVID has all came together, right? Has made this perfect storm of um, these intersections that have put a lot more folks at risk, right? Um, and so I want us, when we're thinking about homelessness, a lot of times, um, first, we don't think about people, right? Because these are our people, our community, our neighbors. But we also don't think of what in the situations that are helping to cause and push those factors moving forward. And so just also like intimate partner violence, particularly for folks of color and particularly for black women um, is a very high driver of what you see when black women are needing to get shelter. Um, and I think, I think on our next slide, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the, the numbers. So I'll wait on that and put them on to Tiffany's thoughts because she'd be dropping, dropping mics. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nermisa. So I'm just really not in love with this third point on the left side that says Black women are three to four times uh, more likely to be murdered by an intimate partner. It's heartbreaking. Can't even finish the sentence. So when I left my relationship, and I reached out for help, I said, I'm going to end up dead or in jail on accident or on purpose. That's just where I am right now, and I need help. And um, it's true. You know, if you imagine a tornado, you know, you draw a tornado on a paper, doo -doo 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 -doo, right? That point at the end is, is death. So it's the death of the relationship because you run for your life or it's the death of the relationship because you kill someone or someone killed you. And the tornado represents this cycle of violence where the frequency, because in the beginning it's spaced out and then it narrows down and becomes more frequent, right? So there's either a consequence or you have to make a decision. And it must be a lack of opportunity to move on and lack of resources and just a lack of understanding what domestic violence is, what power and control is, because I definitely never saw a power and control wheel and didn't know what domestic violence, what domestic violence was until I was 38 years old. Now I know there's more bullying workshops and awareness happening in schools, but not when I was growing up. So I was completely clueless, but I definitely had that fear. I wanted to say something about the coordinated entry system, which is um, when I was housed. So I started my paperwork October, 2014 and I moved him to my place February, 2015. And so I believe it was at the turn of the year where that VI SPDAT came into place with this coordinated entry system. And it was, it was basically my housing navigator, um, you know, the case manager with one of these homeless services agencies who advocated with the shelter plus care eligibility worker to not make me do this VI SPDAT, this intake, this questionnaire, because she said I wouldn't qualify. So you have this scoring system and I don't believe domestic violence was on there yet, right? So you have this scoring system that the higher you score, it puts you at the top of the list for housing. And so her believing that I wouldn't score that high, I wouldn't been able to get this apartment that I've already viewed, that I've already done all of my paperwork for, right? And then just imagine sitting in front of someone that you've never met, telling them all of your personal business. Does it really work that way? Who are you? Why am I gonna tell you anything about myself? And if 
being formerly incarcerated always counts against people and substance abuse always counts against people. Why am I gonna tell you even about my incarceration or my substance abuse that's going to help me score higher in order to be at the top of the list to get housed? I'm not gonna tell you that. Therefore, my score is gonna be low, none of your business. But after a while, a couple of years go by, maybe you do re reevaluate me and all of a sudden I'm saying yes to things I previously said no to. So then it's like, well, what happened? Who's lying? Is it, is it really lying or is it about safety and comfortability and vulnerability? I don't know the person sitting across from me asking me all of my business, that's none of their business. And um, the financial abuse can also be the woman is the one paying the way. The woman is the one getting fired. That's financial abuse, economic abuse. It's not always a higher income partner. And this is my personal story. So I'm just showing a different side to the financial abuse that's mentioned here. And thank you for asking for, you know, for me to elaborate a little bit on the slide. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Yeah, no, I, I wanted to step in really quickly also just to link the um, the homelessness aspect. I know Lorena had mentioned that, you know, it is one third of women experiencing homelessness. So as of 2020, for our point in, con in, point in time count, we had about 66,000 people at the beginning mm -hmm. of, of 2020. This is January. This does not reflect what happened, you know, in March where all of our worlds were just put upside down. Um, and, you know, at that point, they projected there to be about 21,129 women experiencing homelessness. At that point, I can only imagine that number, you know, probably folding three, three times um, due to due to the pandemic, right, we have all of this exist. And then on on top of it, we have the, the issues of, of the pandemic. So I just wanted to also say, you know, that's why a lot of our work around advocacy has been how do we ensure that we are building a housing that has supportive services tied in to, to ensure that we can become whole, right? That's some of the past trauma and can and, and we really become come from a housing first regardless of what what your past might look like but also to for a space for people to really come back to themselves right um so just wanted to to add that um before we jumped right into the other piece so thank you all for your very uh thoughtful and gentle comments <laughs> i'll pass it over uh to uh, norbert say on the next slide Thank you. And then also, I just want to be cognizant. Thank you, Tiffany, for sharing um, your stories with us, because that is difficult. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge we appreciate um, you sharing that because that's helpful for me. Um, and also, you know, it's a good reminder of the, the real people who are feeling real things. And that can look very different for very a lot of people, but it's real people. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to spend some time talking about intimate partner violence in Black women. Um, this is a sigh for me, right? Um, particularly what this looks like in Los Angeles. Um, I was reminded this week um, with the conversation around Quavo and Swati, if y'all are in the hip hop world, you know who I'm talking about. If not, you'd be like, what are you talking about, girl? Um, but there was, um, they had broken up uh, Quavos from, oh God, what is it, the Migos? Okay, Swati is the female rapper. They were in a relationship together. There was this incident that happened on the elevator um, where there was clearly some physicalness that was happening. Um, and the judgment is not about that piece for me right now. It is the conversation that was happening around black women's bodies and how for some reason that there should be more susceptible to violence, right? 
So it was a conversation more about, well, did she deserve it? What did she do? Um, than thinking about intimate partner violence just in general, right? And what do healthy relationships look like? And I say this as a lead up because so many of us don't understand what healthy relations look like, right? And because of the pressures of life that we had just talked about, plus this constant space in where Black women's bodies are devalued and particularly devalued when they're not in relationship with another person, particularly another man, um, adds an extra cultural layer to how these rates are this high. So Black women, again, in Los Angeles make up 9.4% of Los Angeles County, but make up over a quarter of who reported IV, um, IPV, which is intimate partner violence. Black women are more than twice as likely the white women to visit an emergency room and four times as more likely to be hospitalized from IPV. So, and then Black women have the highest rate of homicide out of all women. And it is high, not by a little, but by a lot, right? And so Black women are literally being killed in relationships, right? And I just wanted to raise that because how important it is, one, when we think about, again, that relationship to housing and access to housing and your access to move and your access to capital and wealth and how Black women don't have as much and that sometimes people are having to make decisions about being whether homeless or whether they're going to die in their house. And that's real decisions in real time people are having to make because some of these relationships are killing us. And we as a culture, and I'm not talking about Black culture, but American culture, hasn't really done the work to think about what relationships should look like, have teach healthy relationships to our folks, right? And also have the conversations about toxic masculinity and what that looks like as well when we are moving and thinking about what does it mean for folks to be our ex um, to display manhood and our masculinity, right? And those things are contributing to these levels where Black women are being killed. One of the one of the stats that is not on here, um, that what was surprising to me in a national survey that we did, is that one out of three Black mothers that we surveyed, and this is a national survey, had experienced rape or sexual violence, and excuse me for not putting a trigger um, violence on that. Um, but that is an astronomical number that one third of folks are also experiencing sexual violence in their homes as well, right, or with their partners. And that again, also is putting folks are having to think about their children, their housing, and their livelihood um, and being able to be housed. And so it's just something for us to also think about when we're thinking about those intersections of what homelessness means and what decisions people, or lack of decisions people have when it comes to how they are navigating a housing or homeless system in our space. So, um, I'm still on slide 15. <laughs> and what you just said, Marbese. So, how do you get out of the trap? <laughs> right? And it's really, I don't know, over 60,000 homeless people is is terrible. And so our, we are over 509,000 units short on affordable housing. Then you have the homeless situation, right? And so it, 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 I would say that it's pretty hopeless to be in a situation where you're in a relationship and then you have children and then you don't know the resources. 
And so even those of us in the system do not have a clear one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight step. It shouldn't be that many, but we don't have a clear, clear steps laid out on this is what you need to do in order to get out of there and in order to be housing in your own place, which will most likely be clear on the other side of town. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just a lot to take into consideration consideration, and we haven't caught up with our big old, big old problem, you know? And so I'm just like, wow, people are really going through it. Because even if you do reach out for DV services or homeless services, the reality is you better get in line. It shouldn't be that way. So then this is more abuse, more death, more trauma, more confusion, right? More mental health diagnosis, even if it's depression and anxiety. So we haven't caught up to our problem. A lot of, a lot of positives are shared with what has been accomplished, especially since COVID. But we have, we're definitely not caught up to our problem. And if we're serious about ending homelessness, we got to get serious about ending, ending homelessness. And I'm going to say that it's a heart issue. So, of course, for the advocate, it's a heart issue because they've experienced it. We don't want anybody to, to go through whatever it was that we went through, right? And for the person who has a job, and I'm not saying this for everybody, because people are in this work because it's their passion, right? But there's a disconnect. It's still not an emergency yet. And it's gonna come down to love. So we got the compassion and empathy. Those words are out there all the time. And they're they're real words and there's real things that we feel. But I don't I don't ever hear the word love. I just don't. And if we can't put our heart out there and really love and care about people, how are we going to end homelessness? How? Somebody said love followed by actions. Love is action. The emotion comes because of the action. If you're, let me see, if you're patient with me, kind with me, you're not envying me, you're not boasting about me, you're not being prideful, you're not being rude, you're not being self-seeking, you're not being easily angry with me, you're not keeping records of all the wrongs that I've done. You're not delighting in evil. If you're rejoicing with the truth, if you're protecting me, trusting me, hoping in me, persevering with me, those are, that's love in action, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's love in action. It just is. And so I think with domestic violence, we get caught up in emotion. Right? No way in your actions are you <laughs> loving me but I feel it occasionally <laughs> and we get stuck. We get stuck. And I did want to, to mention something um, about teaching, about healthy relationships. I was fortunate to learn about healthy relationships from prototypes. I stayed connected with them five years, learning about domestic violence and healthy relationships. And it's just a whole awareness that can help a person with their standard and not tolerate what may have been normal all of their life. So you can have, so me, I feel like I had healthy relationships all of my life, but then with, with this person, it was like that analogy with a frog in the water that it's a slow heating up. And then the frog just dies in the water. Whereas if you would put it in hot water, it would just, it would jump out, right? And so I believe there can be a normal that happens in your relationship. But I believe that just from being in classes with several women, several support groups, 
is that it's linked to a previous normalcy. So this appears normal. If getting hit or pushed or cussed at is normal, then if my boyfriend cusses me out, I don't even see that there's anything completely wrong with it because my mama cusses me out. <laughs> right? And so it's a big deal to teach healthy relationships. And where would we do that? <laughs> you know, there's got to be the way to learn about healthy relationships from different places. Messages have to be communicated, whether it's a talk show, a television episode, something on the radio, something on the bus, a bus stop, a billboard, you know? There's got to be something to, to draw people in to even be interested in a healthy relationship to go to a certain place. And now we're we're all in uh, internet land, right? To learn about what a healthy relationship is. And it is the awareness. The awareness is what empowered me. So I was at Prototypes for five years. But my first 90 days, I was in my relationship and nobody told me to leave. It was what I got in those 90 days that empowered me to step. And not into an apartment. I was homeless at the time. <laughs> Walked out into more homelessness by myself. So I think there was a, like a safety because, okay, I'm homeless, but I know this person. So to go out on my own, it was a really big deal. And I did have people who loved me who began helping me once I started being open and honest, you know? And that's another thing, suffering in silence. I'm not going to tell you what's going on with my relationship so you can have all your opinions about me. <laughs> and I'm already giving myself a hard time. So people stay. People, people still don't know what to do. And that's why these numbers are too high. People still don't know what to do. It's too normal. And that's another thing to change. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Tiffany. Um, Thank Frank, you. I think we can go to the next slide, which... Uh... Okay, so challenges for women experiencing homelessness. Survival sex work and correlated violence criminalization. This is for people who are actually homeless. This is what people are doing for money, right? Lack of reproductive health care, include, including preventative care like mammograms, prenatal care, contraception, and maternal care. I know that um, Black infant death and Black maternal mortality is a thing in the Black community, even if you are not homeless. Limited access to menstrual products, lack of visibility and public awareness, Exposure to violence on the streets and in shelters. So if you hadn't experienced violence and if your lack of housing is not a direct relationship, I mean, a direct connection to, okay, let me get my thoughts together. If you're not homeless because of domestic violence, what about once you are homeless? I was so afraid to go into a shelter for this type of reason, right? Major depression and other mental health impacts. So um, how do you not have trauma on the way to becoming homeless? And how do you not have trauma while you are homeless? 
And how do you not have trauma on the way to being housed? So my mental health was impacted by my relationship with my homelessness. So the diagnosis that I was given was depression, anxiety, PTSD. Lack of women only spaces and resources. Women only spaces and resources that are trans inclusionary or do not address the needs of trans women. And I did want to comment on that because is it okay for people to have their own places and spaces? You know, if safety is a factor and violence is a factor, why would you put a trans woman with men? And why would you put them with women? Because a woman with a child is not gonna, may not accept somebody that's a trans woman. Why not have a safe place? It's all about safety. Why not have a safe place where a person is going to feel comfortable, is going to feel accepted, is going to be around people that they can relate to and is going to be able to breathe Right. And I'm I'm thinking in terms of shelters. I'm thinking in terms of interim housing. Because the healing doesn't start when you're in that apartment that you have the keys to. It's a, it's a journey and it can start along the way. And I wanted to invite Lorena and Norbese to share some things about this challenges that women face. I mean, um, Tiffany, I think you, you hit it right on the head. Um, my comment was about just like the need to acknowledge trauma and trauma-informed services, culturally responsive services, uh, to, to not be so quick to, to, to ask like, What's wrong with you? Like, you know, what happened to you? And to see how that can lead to some of the other factors that people maybe see, but don't understand that need to be understood before healing can take place. Uh, the other thing, and that maybe, you know, you can speak more to is that what I've heard from other survivors that are finding themselves housing insecure due to, a dom due to domestic violence is that they're, when they're, figuring out what services to go after, like what um, what providers to to ask for support. You're, in, you're stuck as like, how do you identify? Do you pursue services through a domestic violence service provider? Do you identify as being unhoused? Do you need to be, to experience chronic homelessness before you can get help? And so there, there can be sort of gaps there that can worsen someone's acuity, someone's situation. And I, I think that's a challenge for women to figure out how to navigate the system. Don't forget about substance abuse treatment <laughs> or mental health care, you know, and the fears of even speaking out and reaching out and- mm -hmm. The labels the, that come with oh, those. Yeah. 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 What did I say? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the only thing that I will add, because I um, wanted to make sure that we spend time talking about solutions, um, was the the piece around um, pregnancy and homelessness. Um, I don't have the number right off the bat in my head, but there is a significant amount of women who are homeless who are also pregnant, um, excuse me, are people who are also pregnant. And just that added layer, talking about that infant and maternal mortality and morbidity, which is again, off the chain um, for black women and indigenous women, that one of those pieces, you know, of not having housing or secure housing as one of the drivers or the stressors and that social, um, that causes preterm birth and also low birth weight and very low birth weight babies, right? Which is the leading cause of death for infants and newborns. And so how all these things are connected 
um, and those intersections are really important for us to always keep in mind, right? Like, um, how are we expecting somebody to have positive pregnancy outcomes if they're out trying to search for housing and they are stressed out for it? Um, or they don't have housing at all, right? Um, the whole piece about eating right and all that other stuff goes out the door. That's so true. I um, gained a lot of weight eating dollar burgers and fast food when I was homeless. I see it's something in the chat. Can I answer that last one? Just, yeah, go ahead, Tiffany. Let me see. It's Sarah. For those of us who work in homeless services, could you talk about how we can bring be more trauma-informed in our every day-to-day -day interactions with women on the street and in shelters? You have, I will say you have people who've been homeless who are now housed, who are similar to me, willing to share their story. And there just may be things that, that resonate as you go forward and you are interacting with another person. Maybe they will remind you of something that we've shared in our, you know, testimony, so to speak. And then I would say, um, the job ought to offer you classes. Somebody just mentioned a toolkit that Downtown Women's Center has, and there's a link there. But there's there's so much trauma-informed information now on the internet and people who have taught it that, um, you know, I believe there's a spiritual side to it. And so you, it's up to you and your heart and your mind connecting with these things. I actually trained in trauma and resiliency and um, as a trainer, you know, and one of the things that I've taught is trauma responses. And so I think um, that's what I'll leave you with anyway is understanding trauma responses. So if you're able to identify just, for example, 30 trauma responses, that when you're engaging with a person, I believe it helps to be less judgmental when you're understanding that this is a, I'm actually witnessing a trauma response. This, what, what I think of someone's personality is really, it could be a coping mechanism, right? It could be a trigger that, we, that we're witnessing and so I think having an awareness and then also having love in your heart <laughs> helps you to be, you know, responsive to other people's trauma. Thank you for adding that, Tiffany. I just wanted to add um, as well, I think, you know, obviously with through the work that we do with United Way, I don't get, you know, we don't provide the direct services or, you know, we, we try to bring in the resources to ensure that we could, that organizations like Downtown Women's Center and other folks have the resources to be able to provide these trauma-informed um, services. But, you know, I had, and this is not completely out of context, but it, it made me think of it as you were speaking, Tiffany, that I attended a trauma-informed sort of yoga training. And, you know, even the way that you would approach someone, you know, in the space, which makes me think, you know, if they're doing a position, you're not just going to go and touch their back or adjust their, you know, lower, lower back or whatever, that you just have to approach it in a very consensual way, right? And I would imagine uh, to uh, Sarah's question, I would imagine we would, you would have to navigate in just the same way, right? Even as you're approaching someone, you know, before you sit down, you're making sure that they can see you, that you don't come from behind. All of those things, I think, are are so critical to to making sure that you know that we are creating this this very very safe space for everyone. But thank you for always adding uh, so much more than we we can even imagine. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, if 
We're good. I think I'll, we're going to pass it really quick, briefly to Lorena. And I think, Tiffany, we're going to hear a little bit from you. And then, yeah, we definitely want to have some space right before 7 o'clock uh, to talk about some of the solutions, some of the advocacy um, work that uh, everyone is doing on this call. So I'll pass it to Lorena very briefly. OK. Well, uh, it was my pleasure to more formally introduce Tiffany. I got to know her uh, last year through the Domestic Violence Homeless Services Coalition, where she served and continues to serve as an advocate. Tiffany is a, a systems reform advocate focused on domestic violence, survivorship, mental health, stigma reduction, housing our homeless neighbors and criminal justice reform. She uses, as she's doing tonight, her lived experience to encourage others to tap into their own power to break patterns, cycles, and chains while recovering through trauma, through healing and dealing. Um, she also, as she mentioned, works for the Los Angeles Homeless Services Housing Authority. Um, as I think everyone on the call will agree with, she is a powerful force in the community, and she uses her positive attitude and energy to kindle hearts and change minds and policy. So thank you for joining us, Tiffany, and for sharing already so much of your story. I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. I wanted to address, someone had a question. So let me see really quick. Yeah, and so I just sent you my email address in the chat. So feel free to email me and I can see, I can give you the resources that I have to help you do whatever it is that you wanna do <clears throat> in your situation. Um, it sounds like you want to leave and you don't know where to go. So we, I can be in communication with you about that. And um, thank you for the introduction, Lorena. So I shared along the way which is all a part of my testimony. Um, I will say that <clears throat> I feel like I already mentioned like my healthy relationships, um, you know, my upbringing and things like that. I did have a, in my teenage years, I was living with uh, my dad and my stepmom and wasn't getting along with my stepmom. And my mom's side of the family was where I got these messages like hang in there, stick it out. They wanted me to wait till I graduated high school. So those hang in there and stick it out messages were in my mind and it carried over to this relationship that I was in. Hang in there, stick it out and things will get better and this kind of thing. And so <clears throat> I just had to learn like I can't change I couldn't change him. He came as is, and that I could change myself by exercising my power of choice. And learning that is something that empowered me to shift right away out of that relationship. And um, I will say, you know, when income was mentioned about being, you know, one check away from homelessness, right? It's almost my situation. At one time, I was one unemployment check away from homelessness. And so I, my unemployment was running out and my rent went up $100 in the same month. And the man I was dating wasn't willing to contribute. And this is how my homeless journey started. Um, 60.5% of families with children is, is, is black woman, is the black woman, you know? I just wanted to emphasize that because, you know, one thing that has happened as a result of the George Floyd incident last year 
is racial equity, racial equity, racial equity. How to be an anti-racist, that book, right? Diversity, inclusion. And I believe this is happening nationwide in different organizations. And, um, you know, these things are important for a reason. And, and I wanted to comment about just the difference in money, you know, and, and I'm saying that to say it's very real. So are you tired of hearing about racism? Well, imagine experiencing it, <laughs> you know? So I would just, you know, I'm just gonna say it's a very real experience and I'm not tired of hearing about it. And I just appreciate just the equity lens that people are striving to look through, you know, is is it's um important to me. And um, you know, after becoming homeless, I was living in my car. And so just embarrassed to be even I, you know I, I parked somewhere safe outside of someone's house that I knew got a comfortability that's very common but it's embarrassing because then people will see you in your car right and then um I was revisiting some of these thoughts the other day and I was just broke down you know but just even parking in someone's driveway is so humiliating because why can't I come inside and sleep on your floor? <laughs> At the very least, you know, I'd rather be on your floor than out here in your driveway, right? Then when they didn't want me in their driveway, I'm sneaking into their garage. And the most grateful thing, the, the thing I was the most grateful for sleeping in that garage was there was a bedside commode in there so I could use the bathroom. And one person who lived in that house knew that I was there. So when the house went to sleep, they would empty that bedside commode for me. And so just sharing some of my journey because, you know, it's very real. And it was me getting on cash and food stamps and asking my eligibility worker to help me in this relationship that I kept going back to. So I was five years strong with this person. I was like, man, I don't want to do this anymore. So, but that breakup, that back and forth happened for a few months and I was able to reach out for help and get help. And I was referred to prototypes, a domestic violence agency. And this is where I was able to fill out housing applications. And then two and a half years later, I was part of a shelter plus care program that said, as long as I was taking care of my mental health, my rent would be subsidized. So domestic violence services falls under that mental health umbrella as far as the housing was concerned. But I want to point out that, <clears throat> you know, when I was in therapy, talking about this relationship, they never talked to me about power and control, the power and control wheel, or domestic violence. And it would have been, it would have saved me two years. <laughs> you know, it, it was two years later where I had a self-realization of what I was experiencing. And so I think, um, it's okay to be honest and open with the person that you're sitting across from who may not be in tune or in touch with what's going on. But I think, I think that if I would have looked at that wheel and read it, I would have identified and had like an awakening, you know? Um, I'm one of those people who 
I was getting services during my homelessness. I was going to support groups and having therapy during my homelessness and healing from some of the things that I experienced in that relationship, even though I was, you know, still homeless. And I just, I know people don't get that. I know that they don't. And it would be great if we could shift to, you know, more services, more trauma and resiliency for people, just more, you know, therapy and just the stigma reduction even associated with that. <laughs> you know, you, you, hey, you're going through something because you're living on these streets, you know, but just, being empowered and just having an awareness and an understanding of what I was experiencing because it's hard to, right, be in corporate America, have my own place, have my own car from the age of 17 to the age of however old I was, 38. And then now here I am homeless, right? This is people's real stories, you know? And then just dealing with mental health. And then my substance abuse was marijuana. So so I, part of my PTSD therapy was linking PTSD to unhealthy coping skills and PTSD to substance abuse, right? But just, I appreciated being empowered. Like I chose, what I chose to deal with my trauma, I can unchoose it, right? And it's not easy. I, I happen to believe that it's very, very addicting. It's very addicting as much as it's leisure, right? And as much as it's identified as medical, it's still a coping mechanism that people use to deal with the drama and trauma that they have experienced or are experiencing in their life. And um, it was for me, and I know I can count on all my fingers and all of my toes that people who use it to cope with life, right? So I, I, I think people in the system, right? If you're working with the homeless, if you're really in there, it is no, it's not remote. <laughs> you're not working remotely, right? And have you been vaccinated? Or like me, I haven't made that decision yet. And so I, I, I work with the homeless at one of the hotels for Project Room Key. And um, I'm deciding between this vaccination and my health. You don't have a family member who yeah has, you want me to wrap it up? <laughs> I have a family member who has a reaction to a vaccine. So I'm not just running toward that, you know? Um, you know, so that that's some of my story. And like I said, DV is why I was, I was homeless. And um, it's, it's not, I can only speak from a woman's perspective because I'm a woman, right? No woman should be on the street. No woman should be on the street. And we didn't get ahead of it soon enough and here we are. That there's women on the street. Seniors, it's thousands of seniors on the street thousands of old black women on the street <laughs> thousands of people who identify differently from male and female right thousands of people in the lgbtq and forgive me for not properly knowing the rest of the acronyms that go on the end but 
there's thousands of people who can't go home. <laughs> they can't go home. They're mistreated. And what about the girls? What about the young people? What about the foster youth? So nobody should be on the street. Nobody. I was We're talking so about sorry. women, but nobody. What are you saying, Norbesa? No, I was just gonna say because, like, I do think that, like, because I know we're going over time, um, to talk really quickly about stopping those issues because some of us are working on what about those women foster youth and all those other pieces, um, and want to make sure that, like, we give folks ways to plug in to those pieces because we need everybody's help to do those. Um, but yeah, super. Thank you for like laying it raw. Yeah, some of my um, testimony and some of my thoughts is kind of all mixed in there together. But I think we could probably all stay like maybe a whole podcast. Maybe maybe that's your next step, Tiffany. You have to like start your podcast so we can all just be captivated by both your story and your strength and 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 why you continue doing this work. So thank you so much, and thank you, Nor Norise, for thank stepping, you. helping us, um, uh, you know, move into some of the solution pieces because everything you mentioned as you were talking about, I'm like, you were getting all the services, but you were still experiencing homelessness, right? That's why some of that's why we are all working towards ensuring that we have more supportive housing so while you're getting the treat those treatment and getting be, coming back to yourself you have a safe home a stable place to be whole again because I think without that piece you know we can do everything but sometimes we have to pair it with that housing first approach so I just wanted him to uh, just uh, and then some to ensure that we can keep our, our neighbors who are currently housed. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunities for us to advocate around council rent and a few other opportunities that we're going to follow up via an email. But I did want to pass it to Lorena very quickly because we want to make sure that what you've heard will motivate you and move you to really now think about what's my role, what's the path to really get some of these real solutions on the ground and get them, you know, get people housed, get people the service and the trauma-informed services that they need. So I wanted to pass it over to Lorena very quickly and we'll follow up via email. That's why please ensure uh, to leave your email so we can follow up with some ways that you can truly, you know, post, you know, bring all the love you gathered here to, to, uh, to, to the streets or to the virtual streets uh, and make some calls. So I'll pass it over to Lorena. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, thanks, everyone. I'll try to be just code word each of these things so you remember what they are. Uh, and actually, if everyone in um, Downtown Women's Center put together an advocacy toolkit for how to do advocacy around women's homelessness that has a lot of these resources already in there. Um, but just I know Measure H is something that we hear a lot about. And I'm actually just putting in the chat, the LA Times put out an editorial recently about the role that it can play in prevention. Um, bottom line is that a lot of service providers, are their work is supported and increasingly um, money is diverted also for prevention. So it's something that we don't want impacted. Uh, so I urge you to, to learn more about it and to attend you know, uh, sessions like tonight, community meetings to hear more about it. Um, and if you follow uh, probably any of our socials, you'll see different activations for when we can plug in to call our council members, our, our representatives, our supervisors to let them know how we feel and how important that is. Something that is near and dear to Downtown Women's Center's heart is SB 678, which is um, a state bill right now going through committee in the state Senate introduced by our Senator uh, Susan Rubio. And it's an act calling on the state to recognize unaccompanied women. I know it makes me feel, it makes me kind of think about saloons and old timey, but unaccompanied women in this case means women that are without a partner or dependents and they often fall into through the gaps of services. And this act is calling on the state of California, which would be, we'd be the first state to do so, recognizing women as a subpopulation within the unhoused population, which really would mean that we would be counted and being counted would help us enable us to, to come up with more strategies that would then divert resources to helping um, women uh, connect to those services. 
we are, um, as I said, in committees now. Downtown Women's Center is active on our socials. Um, and there'll be a point probably around September time where the bill will go um, before signature to the governor and we'll, there'll be a call to action around that time. And then finally on the federal front, actually I looked, uh, the Violence Against Women Act was re reauthorized a couple weeks ago. Um, and that for those of you that aren't as familiar, it, um, it's a lot of funding to help persecute um, women that are not women, but to go after uh, perpetrators of uh, violence against women. Um, but the one that is um, still very timely is the Victims of Crime Act. A lot of providers depend on funding from this act as well as survivors um, to, to do some of the many things that Tiffany was mentioning. Uh, things like shelter, housing, legal assistance, counseling, mental health assistance. And that is, um, that is something that is um, being kind of chopped up in the appropriations bill. So these are things that we'll, we can send lots of links out to, but wanted to put them on people's radars. Thank you for the time. And for everyone's time tonight for the extra time. Yes, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lorena. We are eight minutes over, but please you know, say if you have any links, any resources, please send them over to us. We're going to send a follow up email with all of the good stuff that we can send the presentation, but we want to make sure that we can include all of that. So, uh, Nora, say, I don't know if you have anything, but otherwise, you can send us anything our way and we'll send it out to folks who at attended the workshop. I will send it to you because we have lots of things cooking. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, thank, yeah, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. We, we definitely want to hear your feedback. We apologize we couldn't hear your voices, but we have this great resource that's super fun. Uh, and, you know, it's super easy. You actually just, I just posted the link in the chat. You just give us some feedback, give some, share some love uh, with all of us and um, maybe share some thoughts of what you learned or what you want can do next. And, and definitely for sure, we're going to have a follow follow up um, email your way. But I just want to say it was, I'm like immensely full. I was just like an observer in this conversation because I, it was, you know, I was sitting on the, in this space with, uh, with some very powerful, powerful energy this evening to ensure that we can really talk about our work. And thank you. So thank you to Tiffany and Lorena and Norbase for joining us this evening and for all the folks in the back end uh, supporting to make this happen. So thank you so much uh, for joining us and we look forward to um, to seeing you again for another another chat. We have an advocacy town hall coming up as well, which we'll send all of in the follow-up email. So thank you so much. Have, have a good you. night, everyone. Really appreciate thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. I'll keep it open a little bit so folks can catch uh, some of the emails being shared in the uh, in the chat. But thank you. Nice paneling with you, Lorena and Norbeze. Yes. Thank you. Thank you it's all. We really nice appreciate it. All right. I think uh, if and if it's okay, Tiffany and Norbeze and. Um, Lorena, if we can include your emails in the follow-up, maybe mm -hmm. that'll be easy too. Yeah. All right. Fine. Okay. Have a have a good night, everyone. Have Thank a good night, so everybody. Much.